Hello everyone and welcome to a special production of the National Television Network Government Information Service. I am Lisa Joseph. We'll be having a very special discussion with the Attorney General of St. Lucia, Honorable Stephen Julian. And of course, we know that the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Bill has been enacted. It has also been the source of great uh, concern to the public. And in this discussion, we will be outlining some of the key concerns that members of the public have raised. We'll also be delving deeper into the bill itself and what it means to you and for you. Uh, we know that the spirit of the bill is really to help St. Lucia contain um, control uh, COVID-19 and implement measures that will help us to remain safe as we have been doing in the last six months that we've been confronted with the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me now welcome the Attorney General. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with us. And there's just so much to unpack, so we'll get right into it. Um, our country has been under a state of emergency. We know that in the last six months, as I indicated, since COVID-19 came um, came on our shores, uh, we sought to navigate COVID-19. We have had to uh, have a state of emergency in the first instance. Why did we need to enact a state of emergency at that time when we did? And how involved was your office in the um, constant amendment to the uh, Emergency Powers Act under the state of emergency? Well, uh, thank you, um, Lisa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, viewers. Uh, thank you for affording me the opportunity to uh, express my views on this very important uh, uh, piece of legislation which will help us um, navigate the treacherous waters um, which has been brought by this insidious uh, disease. Um, I would like to start uh, because it, I have actually missed the opportunity before to express my profound gratitude to the support that uh, I have received in the discharge of my duties as, as what I've often said to be the custodian of the rule of law in St. Lucia, the principal advisor to the state. There's a lot which happens behind the scenes. Um, my team at the Attorney General's Chambers, they are uh, deserving of great accolade for their professionalism uh, the dedication to their work, their patriotism. I also would like to highlight the often forgotten persons at the government printry who have on every occasion stepped up to the plate um, on short notice and they have helped us to, to get uh, th th these bills and these SIs out. Um, of course, Officer of the, of the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, everyone it was all hands on deck and i was very encouraged by by that level of support of course the the, the media and our our ntm group our have our uh, media advisors they were integral to to keeping solutions informed and uh, of course working with the cmo and the other stakeholders made things a lot easier so in effect, I'm basically saying that I had a big part to play in, in this. There are a lot of actors, a lot of um, connecting parts to make uh, this, this happen. The state of emergency um, is exactly what it was. We were faced with a pandemic, the likes of which St. Lucia has never faced before. And um, we had to make the best decisions um, to preserve life, to preserve the, the average solution. And we had to look at our legislative framework. That would involve the long and tooth um, Public Health Act, also the Quarantine Act, to, to see whether, first of all, we could have um, made the necessary changes and accommodations to protect the citizenry. First thing we realized, of course, is the inability to uh, move forward with a curfew. That is, was simply off the table. The, this, uh, the only way this could happen would be through the intervention of the Governor General by a declaration of the state of emergency. Then you would have to um, uh, consider what is prescribed in the Emergency Powers Act 
and from there everything would, would fall into place. And it was during this time that we burned the, the, the midnight oil, having had all the consultations with the stakeholders, um, cabinet, my cabinet colleagues, of course, I, I neglected to, to thank them for their support. Um, and of course, you know, there, there's, I, I believe that we are where we are and are able to manage this in no small part um, through some level of divine intervention. So as we will come, we will end in the September 30th, 2020 period. So we know that the state of emergency would have come to an end. And if you're hearing the airplanes, it's because we are at the official residence of the prime minister. So we're utilizing that uh, venue. So you'll be hearing during the course of the conversation some extra um, ambiance noise. So don't be too alarmed with that. Um, we were informed that the government would come to the parliament with the COVID-19 prevention and control bill. Mm -hmm. Why did we need to replace the uh, state of emergency with this new bill? Well, this, the state of emergency calls with it, brings with it, um, uh, of course, the curfew and the suspension of the fundamental rights of, of the citizenry, something that we, we do not take lightly. Um, yes, COVID is not a thing of the past, but the, um, the level of, uh, that is required to manage it in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, implementation of the curfew, that simply does not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, it therefore necessitated moving forward to consider <laughs> the same public health act and the, um, the quarantine act um, to to see what can be done to to manage the, the situation moving forward now uh, Lisa, I, I want to, to remind everyone that and, and if you you you, uh, you are able to recall there have been several dates when uh, persons uh, were being advised that the COVID would have been a thing of the past people are talking about July um, even if you recall the extension to September, September yes. it, it caused a huge... the world was looking there, towards there September. You go. But even then, even at the domestic level, um, it was not something which, which garnered much fever uh, within the St. Lucian context because we know what, what is involved here. And uh, so uh, it has always been the plan of the, the AG's chambers, um, uh, the, the Ministry of Health, the, the functionaries in there to review quarantine act review pu public health act and bring it into into this this century but the reality is it was woefully inadequate for instance you have to if you permit me yeah you, ha you have to to consider there's no no provision for any of the protocols in in the public health act so when the the when you see the CMO and these were the SIs which were coming out under the Emergency Powers Act, going beyond uh, the 30th of, of September, we needed to have a piece of legislation which encapsulated the, the protocols. So uh, when one makes the argument mm -hmm. that all that needed to be done was mm -hmm. simply to amend the Public Health Act or the Quarantine Act mm -hmm. and put these protocols in there, mm -hmm. would that have worked? That would, I will not eliminate the possibility that we could have gone that route, but this is a route which I would not have tread upon for a myriad of reasons. The principal one being, it would only be logical to consolidate what we already have. Because remember, we were speaking to COVID-19. Something that is new, that is something new, dynamic, correct. fluid. And it brings its own, um, its own protocols with it. And uh, let, let's use, for instance, this is not new to the, the St. Lucian landscape. We have the Lepers Act. Notwithstanding the fact that we had other pieces of legislation there, it was understood that we needed to have a piece of legislation which spoke to this disease. Mm -hmm. In the case of COVID, um, the, the concept of physical distancing was literally new to the world. What, what you had before, um, for instance, in the uh, Public Health Act was a reference to overcrowding. 
overcrowding in that context really meant, uh, for instance, an establishment not going beyond their capacity. So if your, your restaurant is, is licensed to uh, have 150 patrons, you can be cited. You could have been cited if you had if you went into the uh, the normal due diligence and found you had 200. But that wasn't about physical distancing, which now demanded that you go from six feet apart, or in our case, three feet, mm -hmm. or you wear the masks, and, and all of those things. Even the the um, in in terms of closure of, of businesses under the Public Health Act, you had. Um, references to only certain establishments for for instance the uh, barber shops um, hairdressing salons uh, rest some restaurants but nothing else for the other establishments so you, you didn't want a piece of legislation which spoke to one or two um, uh, classes of, of enterprise you you the quarantine act for instance spoke about um, a quarantine site not a facility that's why you have Rat Islet being the quarantine site under the, the Quarantine Act. So for our purposes, it made sense for not only um, the, the, the practitioners, but the persons who are affected. You pick up your COVID-19 bill, your app now, and it's all in here. It's just a one stop. It's just a one stop. And, and the, even legal practitioners sometimes um, complain about the fact that you, you have pieces of legislation all over the place instead of it being consolidated into one. This is what we were able to accomplish. And it was, a, it was a, in terms of the exercise, I, I imagine you'd have to speak about the issue of cons consultations. Yes. But I, I can assure you that from the onset, from the minute we left the gates, there was that level of consultation. But the consultation process really dealt with when you were establishing those protocols and the SIs. Mm -hmm. So you had that discussion Correct. with the stakeholders, Correct. the various stakeholders Correct. at varying points. Correct. But nothing mm -hmm. on the compilation Correct. of these SIs and protocols. So what are we... Um, is the issue one of substance or is it of form? Because I would believe we would, we would defer to substance. Here we are with, at every stage, we are working with the various stakeholders to put this together. We acknowledge that COVID is going to be here for some time. It is, it is the new reality, the new normal, as, as some say. And we have determined that having gone through that stage, you have literally put the, and at every point, if, if you follow the evolution of the uh, the SIs from 42. We were literally building and tweaking what's in there. And that wasn't being done in in a back room somewhere. It We were getting instructions from the um, command center and they had the, there was a broad cross section of persons in there. I receive, I, I, will, I will not um, uh, uh, disclose the various conversations that I've had, but even on a personal level, I had persons reaching out to me in the various um, um, sectors, making inquiry about certain things, and, and um, this, these are things that we brought through the whole process of, of legislative drafting. Um, it can sometimes be uh, a bit of a task, especially when you have deadlines to meet, mm -hmm. but we have examples of receiving instructions on a Sunday and and an SI being published on a Monday, bright and early, to reflect the dynamic situation which, which COVID brought, brought on, upon us. And um, I, I think we have, for the most part, part rather, handled the, the aspect of consultations um, to, uh, to uh, I'm very satisfied with it. So let's say they, they had input in the initial yeah, stage. Yes. When were the, the, the stakeholders contacted about the bill itself and that the bill was going to come to Parliament, you've compiled it, okay. and the circulation of that bill to the stakeholders? Right. So, uh, thank you for the question, Lisa, but here's what has happened. Remember I, I indicated that we have, as of the 30th of September, most thought that we would not be dealing with COVID anymore. So we were dealing with our SIs, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we move into the stage when it is obvious that we have to move beyond COVID and put things in place. Even then, those instructions to compile the, the consolidate what, what came before and add certain things because the as, as we had indicated had spoken earlier, the Quarantine Act, the um, Public Health Act, there's, there was no provision for the tourism um, standards. Mm -hmm. That was not drafted in isolation. Th there was broad consultation on how it being implemented. The compliance certificates, all of these things had to be done. So once we got through that stage and we're heading into September, the, it, we had a very small window within which to, oh, and, and I must add, that when the decision was taken, we brought in um, more than the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, command center. We had the, the meetings at chambers um, and we, we put this together for submission to cabinet for the approval that occurred on the, on the Monday. And I ensured that it was circulated among the parliamentarians on the Thursday it is something that I have taken, I have insisted upon. No, the, the, the fact of uh, the, the practice that has happened before in terms of legislation being presented on the day and parliamentarians not having the time to, the opportunity to, to digest what's, what's contained therein, that's a thing of the past. So in this context, we made sure everything was with the parliamentarians by the Thursday. And then you had the the, uh, the sitting the following Tuesday. So the the um, situation de um, literally dictated the circumstances dictated that this was the timeline within which we had to work. Put this together, be satisfied with the final draft, present it to, to cabinet, get it to parliament, and bring it before um, to have a sitting so it can be debated. My final question on that would be. Mm -hmm. Someone hearing this will think this is a sh very short period of time mm -hmm. because certainly we knew that the, the state of emergency is coming to an end mm -hmm. and we knew that we would have to do something. Mm -hmm. So the bill was coming into effect. Mm -hmm. uh, why at such a late stage? Because we're looking at just days before the sitting. Right. Is it possible that we could have had this prepared before? So thank you, Lisa, again. And here's the, answer, the simple answer to it. Literally, whilst this document was being drafted, the protocols were changing because you have the uh, three-tier system. You have the World Health Organization, you have the regional CAFA, and then you have the CMO and her team. And whilst we are in the process of drafting this document, you have the protocols changing. And you, you will see it in there and being refined. So we, we, it, it's not something that the legislative process, um, it, is, it doesn't happen overnight. The consultation aspect of it is what took up a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I needed to be satisfied that before it is, that, by, that at the point where it is submitted to, to parliament, that the, that final draft is as close to being what is acceptable that um as, as you could possibly get in the circumstances but i am satisfied with, with what is submitted i actually keep a, we maintain a very high standard um quality of work at chambers were you surprised by the pushback uh i i, I will i will say disappointed in, in a sense um especially when yeah, I, I became aware of, of some of the actors and, and some of the statements which were being made. Um, but then again, I, I do not uh, permit this to, to deter me. Um, I, I we, we believe that we have a, and I say we, at, at Chambers, we have a, a duty to perform and we try and do it as professionally as, as we can. Um, and and uh, that has been my response to it. Uh, I, I don't take these things personally. I, I will say uh, that I was disappointed. Surprised? Probably not. But disappointed because we, we expect um, 
that that leadership isn't something which is seasonal um, you persons are looking to our leaders for for guidance and and they take some may take the 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 line or the um the posture will be um in line with with persons who they, they see as their leaders and at the end of the day we must not lose fact lose sight sorry of, of the fact that this is about COVID-19 um, there's nothing like it nothing in the annals of our history and we will have to to put our all hands on deck and and get this do the best that we can to manage the situation and this is this is all that we endeavor to do the That's chambers has here. always come it's coming under fire because mm -hmm. we will believe that the language perhaps the legalese in there mm -hmm. are not up to par mm -hmm. for want of a better phrasing mm -hmm. um you see this as a fair assessment of, of the work that your, your chamber has been able to put into this yes. and not just only to the covid bill but there have been other complaints that mm -hmm perhaps drafting is, is, is a bit lacking. The skill mm -hmm. of drafting is lacking in the mm -hmm. chambers. That is quite an indictment on the, um, the persons who have been doing this job for a very long time and have received the, the respect of their colleagues throughout the region. In fact, I could tell you that we, are, we, we receive inquiries from, from other countries, other jurisdictions, we are very curious and 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 desirous of of finding out what it is that we're doing and to, to follow some model of, of that sort but some of these questions or, or issues that persons have this this is a, a this is a, a, a comment that any attorney will tell you that they have and they're not unfamiliar with um, to the lay person reading these bills may seem like greek and illogical in, in some point but the 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 craftsmen the the technicians the technical persons the drafts persons they know what they're doing and it's a matter of taking the the instructions and putting it together in a in a way which can be properly um, understood and I, and i've seen instances where persons in their attempt to to understand what's in the act they single out a section but if you, they went a little further or, or with or you, you it would have you, to be read in concert with other parts everything you read the, the bill when some of these persons who are, who are raising issues if you inquire and ask have you read starting from the the interpretation section mm -hmm. section two and go through other parts it will reveal it makes sense it, it will flow and you will understand what's in there. You, you can't pull out a section, read it in, with, in, in isolation, and not be surprised on occasion that you don't understand what's in there. Uh, any legal practitioner who does that will fail. You must read it in, in its context. And I must say it is an easy read. Mm -hmm. I have to say Thank that you. because I read it the, yeah. from cover to cover and it is a fairly yeah. easy read and mm -hmm. easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the bill. Yeah. Earlier on, you, you mentioned about the, under the, the SOE, the state of emergency, mm -hmm. um, the uh, restriction of the liberty of, 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 of uh, nationals and so forth. How does the bill differ to the state of emergency in that regard? how does the in terms of restricting the freedoms and liberties because that is the main concern of st oceans that this bill is oppressive so there's a we have the um the constitution which which guides us all right and i took the liberty of just pulling out some sections in it if you permit me to sure. to um go through them quickly we have the uh, protection of fundamental rights and freedoms which is the uh, the, the head the captain protection of right to personal liberty a person shall not be deprived of his or her personal liberty save as may be authorized by law in any of the following cases that is to see and it goes down and it's, it says what goes on g says for the purpose of preventing 
the spread of infectious or contagious disease. So here it was, it says, you can pass law, right? To, to a person shall not be deprived of his or her personal liberty, save as may be authorized by law in any of the following cases, that is to say. You have A, B, C, D, E, F, G says, for the purpose of preventing the spread of an infectious or contagious disease. So the constitution permits that. Protection from deprivation of property. No property of any description shall be compulsorily taken possession of, and no interest in or right over property of any description shall be compulsorily acquired, except for a public purpose, and except where provision is made by a law applicable to that taking of possession or acquisition for the prompt payment of full compensation, you have freedom uh, section 11 protection of freedom of assembly and association um, nothing contained in or done under the authority of any law shall be held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of the section to the extent that the law in question makes provision a that is reasonably required in the interest of defense public safety public order public morality or public health and it goes on protection of freedom of movement etc now it, it just uh, responds to those who believe that this is unconstitutional it isn't but folks I, and i will say it over and over again this is that's this is another reason that we've put it in the covid bill in that act sorry so th whatever is contained in there and it has a date by a sunset clause two years in the ma in, in, for, in the maximum of two years from the date when it was passed so we appreciate that the fundamental rights and freedoms of persons will be affected but the law permits us to do that why because of the public health concerns attendant to COVID-19 but these restrictions would come would they come mm -hmm as the situation dictates. This is not a, 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 a situation where now we say to individuals Correct. that there's no curfew th that is imposed at this moment. Correct. So as the situation dictates, we will move as with the SIs, mm -hmm. that you would say, well, okay, we're now faced with a situation where we've just gotten 10 uh, cases. So let's see where we're moving and how we're going to move Correct. to address it. Correct. Yes. Okay, so let's move on further. There has been the suggestion that the Minister uh, for Health and other government entities that have been granted sweeping powers mm -hmm. with this act. Explain to us what that is, because we've been told that the Minister can uh, sort of create law, can just sit and legislate at the stroke of a pen what needs to be done, and then it needs to be enforced. Explain to us what are those powers that the Minister has. Okay. So let, let's put this in context. The competent authority during the state of emergency was the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister literally doesn't feature in this leg piece of legislation at all, except when he acts in the capacity of uh, the Minister, Minister of, of Finance, Finance for, procurement. for Procurement. Other than that, you will see the, it's reflected throughout the piece of legislation that the, the COVID-19 Act, well, I mean, that the, um, the principal, the minister, as referenced by the act, is the minister of health, who has to act in consultation and concert with the CMO and the other technocrats. So the minister is not acting unilaterally. And the suggestion that the, the, um, there will be regulations, the minister cannot create offenses, because if you look at the regulations, I think it is 62, Sorry, not 62, 65. The, the, the sort of regulations, the nature of the regulations is, is clearly stated. Mm -hmm. What the minister can do after consultation, the re it starts here. The minister may, on the recommendation of the chief medical officer, make regulations to give effect to this act. So you're operationalizing aspects of the act. You will notice that in the... Uh, in the body of the act which deals with uh, so, uh, physical distancing yes. there is no number what is anticipated and what has already been done 
is you have regulations to deal with that. So the minister acting on the advice of the CMO will get the, the regulations um, prepared. But uh, the minister is not making an offense. Remember, there's a process. If you are in breach of any other regulations, you have to, you will be charged. So the police will get involved, excuse me, and you have to be, you have to appear before court someday. So for there to be um, a determination as to your fate. So there's proportionality in terms of the, the sort of sentence that, that is imposed. The magistrate may decide um, this is not as, as egregious an offense, uh, sorry, uh, an act. So I may caution, reprimand, and discharge you. But they may decide to fine you $1,000 if you're a repeat offender, if you're the, uh, the owner of a business establishment, having been fined once or twice and you, you continue to break the protocols, they may decide to seize your, your, your goods. And let's use an example. We, I, I don't mean to single out any um, particular sector, but this is the one that, that some persons may be familiar with, where during the, the lockdown period, um, certain refreshment facilities conducted their, 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 their plied their trade where persons would come in and you have a, a, a the back building door. through the back door and you have the, the places crowded, windows are closed and they, they're in there for hours. That could have uh, triggered community outbreak. So a magistrate, for instance, um, being made aware of the facts of, of a particular case or the, this person has been doing this is a repeat offender may decide um, you're going to lose your goods. It's going to be forfeited. So. Um, it's it, the minister's role on the issue of, of the offences. It's it's, um, it's it's not a correct um, representation. So she's not, she, she will not be able to create an offence no, other than can't. what's contained she can't. in the act. She is limited to the powers given to her by statute. She can't divine anything because the regulations state what you can um, create. The, for which, what, what sort of offense that will be attached to, what, what offense that you will, you by order, publish, and, and we take it from there. So when we speak to the regulations to give effect to, to the act, mm -hmm. um, on the recommendation of the CMO, mm -hmm. these regulations, are we talking about protocols and the, how to enforce those protocols? This is what we're referring Co correct. to. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so not any criminal uh, apathy. So yeah. we, we, we have been able to, to get that. Um, and well, we'll get to the penalties a little later on. Mm. We spoke about the, the two-year um, span for the COVID bill. Mm. Now, the idea that we could have gone through a six-month period, mm. would that have sufficed um, extending along the way when necessary? Would that have been a, 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 a good option for us? within the we, we, state of for, for the act oh for the so act. instead of giving it a two-year life mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. could we have given it six months and after the six months do a review but uh, guess what lisa the way it is drafted we could give it three months because section 6066 subject to subsection two mm -hmm. this act expires two years after its commencement the minister may, on the recommendation of the chief medical officer, by order published in the Gazette, extend or shorten the expiry of this act under subsection 1. An order made under subsection 2 is subject to an affirmative resolution of parliament. So let me deal with the first part. Then, so the, the two years, this is something that I didn't define. It's, it's we, we, be deferred as we've done throughout without fail we have deferred to the advice for, of the cmo and her medical team I, I have a great deal of respect for those individuals so when the cmo indicated that who CAFA, and, and uh -huh. the PAHO, they've all agreed that this is the, the time frame within which we are to deal with this disease, COVID-19. Not measles, not chickenpox, COVID-19. This is where the two years came from. And we, uh, we 
de decided on a formula whereby if it is shortened because we we know about the russians the, the indians the chinese um some other european countries are working towards th this vaccine uh, as well as the us so within two months we may well have the the capacity to arrest this disease so this is where the trigger comes in to by way of order publish in the gazette um, shorten or lord forbid we go beyond the two years but here's the caveat it must excuse me it must be it is subject to an affirmative resolution of parliament which means that resolution has to be brought before parliament so the minister can't sit at her desk and absolutely make a phone call absolutely not over. absolutely not she for the two years she need not do anything and on the at the end at the two-year period that will be the end of the act the sunset clause but if it is deemed necessary to shorten it or lengthen it she cannot in our case um it's a female minister uh, minister isaac would not be able to do that um uh, without parliament's intervention by what we call affirmative resolution um, in the very beginning of the bill, uh, the act, we have the creation of the command center. Yes. That has drawn some uh, question as well. <clears throat> the makeup of, of the, the, the center, we have um, the CMO, mm -hmm. various representatives from the government there. Uh, should there have been someone from the private sector, civil society, included in the command center? Uh, thank should you. should broaden. Okay. So, the, uh, you said the... CMO and other government. Yeah, so we, we, we do right? have um, so the permanent secretaries from correct. tourism, so health, this finance. This is what this is where I'm going, because persons need to appreciate first of all that the command center is not a, a new phenomena. Under the the state of emergency, the uh, competent authority, the prime minister, came up with the the idea to have this command center. It's now codified, it's now been refined, it's now been, it's now included in this piece of legislation. So what you have here is one, a chairperson who is appointed by cabinet. Number two, the Why does that person not need be the Minister for Health? Because well, if the Minister for Health is a competent authority for the Act, within the Act. That's a good question, but you have other stakeholders. Why not the Minister of Tourism? Why not the Minister of Finance? Why not the Minister of Equity? They all could put a legitimate case to chair this command center. And we also have to be mindful that the Ministry of Health is represented here. Right? We do have the Commission of Police You have the Commission there. of Police. We have the National Emergency Correct. Management Nemo. Organization. The Tourism Authority right. is there as well. The yeah. Principal Information Officer for the Government Information Correct. Service. Right. And... Uh, where the members shall be appointed by cabinet on terms and conditions Correct. determined. But there's also a provision within the Act here uh, where it speaks to co-opting Correct. Individuals I, I was, to I was come about to, to get to that. I was about to get to that because you will notice in the, the uh, formal composition that is under Section 6.1, you do not see the Ministry of Equity. You do not see the Ministry of, a representative of the Ministry of, Ag of, 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 of Education. You do not see um, the Attorney General. We're not here. But Section 7.3, and if I, I could read it, yes. the chairperson or the deputy chairperson of the command center may co-opt a person to attend the meeting of the command center at which it is proposed to deal with a particular matter to assist or advise the command center. So by invitation, you bring in the persons, similar to what happened with um, AG's chambers. We, they may, there may not be a necessity for us to be at every meeting, but whenever the legal advice is, is required, we are a phone call away, or we can be invited to, to come and advise, prepare an opinion. The, so, the skill, so whatever they need to get that, the work done, it's, they have the power to, as the, the legislation says, co-opt 
um, that skill set. So this doesn't preclude them from calling Absolutely in any other, not. whether it be the National Youth Council, Absolutely taxi not. associations, Absolutely. and so forth, so yes. people can and, come and in. And we, we could look at um, the composition of NEMAC. Yes. NEMAC filled the, the conference center at, uh, at uh, the financial center. So you, you can't have a, a group of decision makers being such a large body. Anyone who has, has a, um, participated in these meetings, you, you need a core group of persons. And as per custom, you call in whomever else you need to, to assist in the decision making process. So the command center in a sense is really a sort of nucleus. There you go. And from there, then anything can, can mushroom, Absolutely. can branch out. Yes. Let's talk about immunity. Yes. Um, we uh, know that <laughs> within the House of Assembly, we have the, the, the senators, we have the uh, MVs. Mm -hmm. um, in the House of Assembly, there is that privilege. Right. Um, and so they are afforded immunity for things that would have been said in the House. The legislation the, the act gives the chief medical officer and the other public officers mm -hmm. um referred therein immunity right. so is this the right interpretation of of this section that is section 61. so section 61 um first of all you said this is this is a false analogy right um because the scope and application of 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 uh what what you call parliamentary privilege is quite different from what section 61 um, provides uh, in terms of our frontline workers our public servants but what, what we have here 61 no action shall lie against the chief medical officer public officer member of the royal st lucia police force in respect of an act done or omitted to be done in good faith mm -hmm. so let, let's give you the, and the, the the parliamentary privilege really speaks to um freedom of speech and the ability to to uh, conduct their affairs and, and what have you this this is a completely different scenario and again we are dealing with COVID-19 let me give you an example um, in terms of, of how this this immunity would work and it's, it's not a blanket um, uh, immunity the statutory purpose of this piece of legislation is clear and uh, probably I should have read it earlier. Uh, if you just permit me one second, sir. With the, the statutory purpose is the confines within which this act is supposed to operate. Okay. The statutory purpose means the preservation of the public health. That's in, in, in uh, section two of the act. Means the preservation of the public health, maintenance of public order, and the securing and regulating of the pricing supply and distribution of food fuel light power and other necessaries so these are the four corners of this act so anyone who is who's performing a duty under this act covid 19 act it is necessary for them to have that level of immunity which i, I will get to this uh, a little later but for our purposes, here, let's get into this example. You recall um, a case of a, uh, there was a false positive test on this individual who, who had went traveled to, who had traveled to, St. Vincent. to yes. St. Vincent. And this triggered a response by the team, the, the CMO and her team, in terms of um, the... Uh, uh, how they dealt with the co-workers or the quarantining of the co-workers etc etc someone could have determined that or, or made a case that the it was wrong of of the cmo to have uh, have um quarantined them they were deprived of their their, their liberty etc 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 now that state of emergency i'm talking about moving forward if a similar scenario occurs what is the protection for those people are they now going to second guess themselves when they get that information are we are, are they going to are they required now to sit and run a test three four times before they move because by that time we could talk about community spread of thousands so we need to give them the protection to perform their duties 
and to do so quickly without having the, the, the prospect of, of um, litigation to follow them. In fact, they would be sued as servants of the state yes. anyway. So really and truly, they, we would be facing a deluge of, of cases um, where, where persons will be claiming uh, uh, for compensation for acts done to them. And we need to have that sort of protection. This is not something which is, is going to be exercised in a capricious way. The, there are, as I just indicated, by the, 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 the statutory purpose, the parameters within which they are supposed to work. Now, Lisa, this, this is not new to our solution context because the persons who have been advocating for the use of the Public Health Act would ought to have realized that this is a, a, sim, it's a replication of what obtains in there. They need to only look at um, the, I had a section here, in the, the Public Health Act, right, section 19 of the Public Health Act, it says, in fact, it says a bit more, nothing done, directed, or authorized by the minister, CMO, or, uh, or medical office of health, or any person acting under the authority of any of them shall, if such thing was done, directed, or authorized in good faith for the purpose of executing any of the provisions of this act, subject such persons to any action, liability, claim, or demand whatsoever. Section 61 says, an action or other proceeding shall not lie against the CMO, public officer, a member of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force in respect of an act done or omitted to be done in good faith in the exercise or purported exercise of his or her functions under this act. And I used on good faith the example if you tie it in, you got this, this um, um, the false test, positive, yes, the false, yeah. but you didn't know it was false, it, was, uh, it, was ne it, was, it ought to be negative, but you got a positive test. Let's do the, the, um, the, do, do the, the, the due diligence and pull these persons out, identify where the community spread is. You're acting in good faith. You need to protect those persons. We live in a very litigious society. We can't deny that. So we must give these persons a level of cover. So but, then I so think the public wants to know what protects them then. Because, and I think too, what is the most contentious mm -hmm. aspect of that mm -hmm. is to lies with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. So here's my response. If you look to Section 3 of the Act, the same COVID Act, it says none application where this act conflicts with the public health act or other enactment the exercise of a power conferred by this act is inconsistent with another act this act shall not apply in so far as it conflicts with the power conferred under this act shall not be exercised so as to limit or restrict the exercise of the public health act or other enactment that means criminal code remains intact mm -hmm. all the other pieces of legislation it does not create a situation where these other pieces of legislation become secondary to it that was not the case under the state of emergency so as much as so the, the issue of liability is if is specific liability speaks to civil matters i think people need to make or the citizenry we, we need to appreciate the difference you have criminal prosecutions and you have civil liability so if you are acting in good faith under this act if you have to go and detain someone to to um, for community spread you you some persons may not be compliant mm -hmm. and you may have to use some level of, of justifiable force etc you have the cover under this act as it pertains to a lawsuit but that does not prevent the individual from uh, uh, so acting as a as a virtual complainant uh, and and you've been charged criminally if it is found that you've met that threshold so if someone has a, a sort of well i say query the word loosely um, but certainly if, if they felt that they've been wronged by the police, that their rights have been trampled, 
you can go to the criminal code certainly, in order for you to address certainly, that. Certainly, certainly. And so this is not the end all and Correct. be all of Correct. that. But it gives, once you have acted, once this, these functionaries have acted in good faith, that's a standard. As, that's, uh, this is why I like this um, real-time actual example of the, the case of St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. These persons acted in good faith. Persons who, it, they, they, it was uh, mandated that they remain in quarantine for the 14 days, etc. So, um, there are instances and there is good justification for, for the immunity. Excuse me. And further, we have precedent for it. This is, this is not new to our body of law. As I said, you need only look at the um, Public Health Act. Those who are so minded could look at section 19, which speaks clearly on exemption from liability. And to speak about with, um, this act not superseding any other laws, we had section 62, mm -hmm. which was withdrawn. Correct. Um, where it spoke to the publication of false statements. Right. And so the, the, the thinking at, at the time of the withdrawal was that we have laws that sufficiently deal with this. Correct. And, and you, Correct. Remain, you remain... Correct steadfast in that thought that we need not have this cover in, in the act well remember the spirit and, and you had you, you, you said so eloquently that it made sense to have it all in one piece of legislation so persons who understand that under covid you 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 could cause mass hysteria um so it, it creates that responsibility of of persons who have the means to to uh, uh, disseminate information, uh, whether it be on social media, whether it's the formal pub, uh, media houses, etc., verify that information. But was it only targeted at mainstream media, Absolutely media houses? Not. Because Absolutely. in this dynamic age mm. of social media, everyone is there you go. pretty much a walking media go. house. There you go. Um, I, you recall during the early days the panic which was caused when. Um, persons I, there were some reports of, of deaths and yes. and they were coming from senior persons who you expect when i say senior persons i'm talking about senior technocrats etc persons who you believe would have had the, done their due diligence and determined the veracity of, of what, what they were putting out and these persons were acting very irresponsibly you've had cases of of persons who have fallen ill at home for for ailments that have absolutely nothing to do with COVID and they've been targeted in their community, they've been isolated, etc. Et so we've had, um, there was merit in doing it, but um, I, I had no issue with, with its removal in, the, in the, um, the, the final draft bill which was presented to, um, the bill, sorry, which was presented to Parliament. Okay, but we still have uh, monitoring, oh, yes. and oversight oh, yes, over oh, yes. information that yes. comes out and Correct. being able to control. Uh, right. and, and I encourage Solution, let's be very responsible about this. Um, because it's far reaching. Correct. It is far reaching. Correct. Correct. Uh, let's talk about Section 57. Now, that deals with um, individuals' medical information. That is another concern mm -hmm. because people want to know what exactly is it that you're sharing about me mm -hmm. with third parties. Uh, so what is, um, is what's been said correct, that the private medical information can be disseminated without one's knowledge? So and do they need to agree mm -hmm. for that information to be shared? Okay. So Section 57... Um, Again, I, I reference my encouragement to persons to read, read the entire section. Because had they gone to subsection 2, two. 50, sub, section 57, subsection 2, where it says, um, it, the, this, in terms of the transfer of information, it shall not apply if the person has given his or her consent to the transfer. So if I agree to it, that is fine. Number two, the transfer is necessary to safeguard public health and see the matter concerns public health. Let us use our example of, of the Vincentian. How would they have been able to trace where this individual worked, 
who that person would have been able to be in contact with. The public health, the interest of the public health trumped that person's need for privacy. Because again, folks, we are dealing with COVID-19. It is silent. It does not discriminate. So as soon and, and you, you see we have the sharing of information between territories and there are safeguards the safeguards are that the country or territory to which the health information is being transferred has comparable safeguards to those in St. Lucia for the protection of the rights and freedom of a person in relation to the processing of health information and the CM was authorized the transfer of that health information to that person. So we have our internal um, measures to protect the identity of that person. Um, because it's never published. Exactly. The identity is never exactly. published. For, for instance, you have, um, and, and in my conversations with persons in the, in the medical field, that the uh, AIDS, persons who, who, who have um, AIDS, then you have a code. So that's going to, there's only be, that is um, deciphered only by certain persons. So you will, you will not have the access to that person's name. COVID is different because you do not, um, uh, AIDS would not be spread through contact, through person coughing. I mean, we know the manner, the various ways that, that we, um, that uh, this COVID disease has spread. So it will be imperative that we know the identity of that person for the purpose of tracking down who else that person has been in contact with. There is no other way to do it. So we need to point. know this is Jane. Correct. And Jane, were you with Tom? Correct. Were you? Did you, uh, you know, Correct. shake hands with, with, with Paula and Correct. that sort of thing? Correct. So we need the names to we do the, the contact names. tracing, go into the community, right. go to the work establishments mm -hmm. and find these individuals. Correct. And the controls is not, um, is within the ministry. The technocrats who have, you know, are, are trained to deal with that sort of information. No one is going on the airways to broadcast someone's name um, could someone tell me where Jane Doe is? This is not what it's about. The, the uh, patients, um, patient zero, the person who is afflicted, and the persons who have in the, the circles, you, you're going out and you're finding out who, are the, who has been in contact with whom, so that they could try to arrest the, the spread of, of the disease. I want to talk about the electronic monitoring devices and i must say that i was quite pleased when i saw that in there because i remember in the very beginning at the height of, of what our covid uh, crisis was mm -hmm. individuals were were really clamoring for us to have a method to mm -hmm. be able to track all these people mm -hmm. who are going into quarantine and who's not right. complying and so forth right. we spoke then in there we were banding about whether we need apps and that sort of thing so the electronic monitoring device, um, that's in part five section, beginning section 45. 45. So that's new for us, but um, mm. we know that it's being used uh, in, in some countries, in the mm. uh, metropolitan countries, mm. to monitor individuals mm. and to assist contact tracing. But we have a contention here that um, some people have interpreted the legislation mm. to meaning that the electronic monitoring devices are only for nationals, for residents, it doesn't apply to visitors. Is mm. that the case? That is absolutely incorrect. And again, I implore persons, read the act. Um, I will, it, it, the acts will be published on the government website. I don't know if that has been uploaded as yet, but we are going to do those things so the public could, could download it and, and have a read. It's, it's simple. And again, if you permit me, uh, administration of the electronic monitoring device, that is section 45, 45. subsection 1. An electronic monitoring device shall be administered by the ministry for the purpose of monitoring A, whether a person has during his or her quarantine left his or her home. Of course, you're talking about nationals. But right after it is B, whether a person who has during quarantine at a place approved by the CMO left the place of accommodation. 
that is the, the facilities, the hotels, the, um, in fact, they uh, um, have been reliably informed that the, the Airbnb sector, the informal sector, or, um, the, that and the, the tourism product are, are now considering opening and getting back into business. But clearly, B speaks to everyone because a place approved by the CMO, the chief medical officer, um, a place of accommodation includes the hotels and these are the places where the foreigners will, will be able to stay. And we'll be aware that before you come into St. Lucia, you need to show where you booked. So, so these persons are compliant. They, that's where the certification comes in. So we could do the monitoring, etc., etc. If you, you choose to, to spend a month in St. Lucia, we're more than happy to have you. But when you go out into public, you will have this band or um, the bio sticker. So for those who would wish to understand the, or, or get that definition, if you look to uh, section 45, uh, subsection 8, in this section, you have the bio sticker, which means an electronic monitoring device that is worn on the upper left chest to monitor the vital signs of a person. So this device, as I understand it, too, could relay uh, critical information like your temperature, the, the hallmarks that the, the health officials are looking for to determine if someone is deteriorating, etc., um, as it pertains to possible COVID infection. And you have the electronic tracking wristwatch, means an electronic monitoring device that is worn on the wrist to monitor the location of a person. So that is tied in with um, GPS. So that information is being monitored in St. Lucia, or is this by a company stationed elsewhere? This, inform based elsewhere? this information is being monitored in St. Lucia. They are, it's not being monitored by the police. It is being monitored by the, um, the health officials. And if, if needs be, they will have to solicit the, the, um, the intervention of the, seek the intervention of law enforcement. If person is three, because you would have that person's number. Yes. You you they, they notice some um, contact number. They noticed um, an activity which conflicts with with the conditions Within and the, the protocol. They be. would call a person. What's going on? Because um, the I wrist will be able to tell you, you. The wristband will tell you whether it's in the left there. There you go. Those the domicile location. There you go. Someone may may reside on a farm, and maybe a three four acre farm. But I'm, I'm still in my yard, really. And you, you can, by a simple phone call, determine this, this is nothing to be alarmed about. Or this person is, is out fetting and um, we need to, to bring this person in. And I think that when you speak to the accommodation, large properties, mm -hmm. you have that additional layer mm -hmm. of security guards. Correct. But with the Airbnbs, we don't have that. Correct. So this would work very well in Correct. being able to do the monitoring. Correct. Over in section 19, um, in that 19? response plan, yes, mm -hmm. where we speak to the COVID-19 response plan, the recommendations that a <coughs> template be developed for the entities to follow in order to formulate their own plans. Because mm -hmm. I think this says uh, that the individuals must formulate their plan and present as opposed to them being guided. Excuse me. Y yes. And developing a plan. Right. So this... Um, would assume that you could have a one-size-fit-all sort of template. Um, I don't think that is practical. Uh, you you need to to appreciate the the, the 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 need for tailoring the the protocols to fit the establishment. For instance, uh, a mom and pop supermarket, a little shop, corner shop. Um, will have to have will ha will have will have a, a, a protocol that is peculiar to them you you will not have it for the bigger establishments you will not have uh, a, a bigger supermarket where it has a, a greater s spacing and or the, even if there was even difficulty with um, the churches where you have the smaller churches you have the uh, you have for instance the cathedral so you, you can't have a one-size-fits-all template. I, I accept the, 
the um, the suggestion that um, probably in another scenario, but we are dealing with uh, creating a template. Again, remember we are dealing with COVID. COVID but is we do have the specific protocols that are tailored for specific sectors. Correct. But even then, it still needs to be refined. That is why you have that um, the CMO is required, it will, will determine that this person is required to develop a plan for their particular um, establishment. You have the basic protocols, but before you get that certificate, you want to know um, what are you doing for your, your space, for your enterprise. And moving forward, we, we have two years within which to work with this. We can come up with a regulation. It need not be in the principal act because the protocols, it, it's dynamic. The same way, we, in, in much the same way as uh, during the state of emergency where you, there were changes in terms of right now, for instance, let, let us use the example of um, uh, social events. Mm -hmm. We are now permitted to have social events of up to 500 persons, right? That could change. So we could also, um, as, as we, 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 get, uh, we, we, we get a better understanding of, 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 of the, the disease, the, the need of our people, then we could come up with the, the, the template. But it would be an awfully long template to cover just about every scenario. It, it makes sense to have you formulate it, present to the CMO for approval. But it's something that, that can be considered, but not necessarily one that has to be reflected in this current act. But as has been the norm, no one has been left on their own. So they, they can't, you know, can't say they can pick up the phone, mm -hmm. they can ask for some guidance, uh, and uh, I think uh, that has oh been yes, oh yes. from oh the yes, very onset. Yes, yes. Right, so we've dealt with that. We want to go to um, section 27, mm -hmm. where we speak about the uh, compliance certificates. Right. Uh, we have a number of businesses that have already um, opened mm -hmm. up. Uh, those who are in the, the, the in the process of obtaining mm -hmm. um, compliance, mm -hmm. in terms of the notice given on the revocation right. of such a certificate, is there sufficient time being given to a business um, where they may you may have to revoke that so, compliance certificate? Again, the issue of the, of the COVID. 19 compliance certificate that is section 31 mm -hmm. um and it says that oh, oh, uh, before i answer if, if i may the and that, that's to persons who have already been issued the certificates it says that a covid 19 compliance certificate issued prior to the commencement of this act is deemed to be issued under this act so persons need not be um, worried about the the, uh, any compliance certificate which was duly issued during the state of emergency um, lapsing or being of, of no effect. They need not apply. Once it is current, they are Never fine. Hold. Correct. Okay. So it's, it's like you've been grandfathered into this, this, um, this act. Now, this, uh, if we turn to section 34, mm -hmm. so you, just a turn of the page from the issuance of the, the compliance certificate, that's section 31, if you go to section 34, which deals with the revocation of the compliance certificate, this is not something that will be done um, without proper consultation because the ministry responsible for tourism may, on the advice of the CMO, the ministry, not the minister, responsible for tourism may on the advice of the CMO. So you have Ministry of Tourism, Ministry, sorry, uh, Ministry of Health with the, 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 the CMO. If they determine that they are for whatever reason, they decide that they want to revoke the, um, the, the certificate, the certificate for, for accommodation for, and other correct. businesses associated right. with tourism. Right, they must give the holder of the certificate notice in writing of the proposed revocation and his or her reasons for doing so, and they must and the holder of the the notice must state within twenty one days they may make representation to the ministry responsible for tourism 
um, why the certificate should not be revoked. So it is not automatic. So you have been cited really for being non-compliant. And you're given time to respond. 21 days. So you, and, and, and again, you, once this is, once this is triggered, the individual would have the ability to, to approach the, the Ministry of Tourism and indicate what the case was, why um, they would be found wanting, and they would be given an opportunity to address it. But also included in there, because there will be persons who have determined or, or for whatever reason they will be it will be determined that their certificate ought to be revoked because this person has continued to break protocol they are put in a state at risk we, we, it takes all types when that is done we have a responsibility to ensure that the general public is notified of that revocation and that is where section 34 subsection 4 the ministry responsible for tourism shall publish in the gazette the revocation of the covid 19 compliance certificate that is what a responsible ministry would do so it's, it's not something that's good because you would for instance it may be a restaurant mm -hmm. and you have a responsibility now to ensure that having they would proudly display the certificate but if they're found wanting if that's it, there's a need to revoke that certificate then equally the ministry of tourism will have the responsibility to publish the names of the of the of those persons or, or the entity um which has been the subject of the revocation that publication will be in the gazette so is the intent of this section to really further license establishments um mm. to to put undue pressure on them even by by way of incurring more operational cost is that the intent of this section well the intent of the section remains the protection of the citizenry if you are providing a service to the general public you have a resp in the the covid 19 environment we have to ensure that you have met the standards that you have your, your you ensure people will ensure that persons wear the mask you have the the stations by which they could wash their hands you do not do the overcrowding etc etc so they that unfortunately lisa is the cost of doing business in the covid 19 world there, there's no way around it we spoke earlier about the powers of the minister uh, <coughs> there in, in, in the act. Mm -hmm. um, in section 11, 11. Uh, the granting, the, the minister has the ability to requisition private property. We alluded to that earlier and even under the um, quarantine act, I believe mm -hmm. it was, when you made mention of it. So the requisition of private prop property does, mm -hmm. um, are we not respecting the rights of the property owners? Mm -hmm. What exactly are we looking to achieve under this section? So you have a fear um, and there's a legitimate concern because the constitution protects you from the deprivation of property. Um, and that notwithstanding, as I articulated earlier, there are instances where the constitution will permit um, the, the, the state to pass law and consider it good law if that is to protect the citizen a public health public order for instance mm -hmm. so remember the you recall my reference to the statutory purpose the parameters the boundaries within which this act is supposed to operate whatever is requisitioned has to be for that statutory purpose and let's let's use an example um let me, let me think of a, an actual example during the at, at some point one of our um friends in the international scene was accused of of intercepting ppes etc 
uh, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, and this was happening to some nations within the Caribbean, who had ordered for the protection of, 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 of their people. So the, the individual, sorry, the, the um, country has a need. There's still a need for the PPE that they've paid for, etc. and they, they, they don't have access to it. The decision can be taken, the CMO in acting concert with the, sorry, the minister acting concert with the um, consultation with the CMO, may determine the receive information that a supplier of health supplies, we have a few of them um, in, in our enterprises, in, in our local um, scenario, our, lo our local um, case, um, may have a warehouse full of PPE, PPEs, right? Personal protective equipment, I think that's what it means, yes. right? We may decide we want, we, want, we want to get hold of those to give to our frontline workers. This person may not have the ability, may have been, um, have purchased it and fortunately for them, they have it warehouse, they're planning to sell it through their normal channels, but we had a greater need, the public health. So, having identified this warehouse, we would have gone in there, requisitioned it, taken the items, but as is prescribed by the constitution, after the requisition, the government shall make prompt and full compensation in the circumstances of in, in the circumstances to the owner or occupier of the building vessel aircraft or article and i'm reading from section 11 subsection 3. so you would not have a scenario where the government walks in takes your your, your, because I your, think that's what people product. are thinking, almost, to the, almost like no. you know the German no. days of Hitler, no. where you can just walk no. in, that's throw people happen. out of their property, and take it over. That's not going to happen because we work within the statutory, um, the, the statutory purpose, and for to just reiterate it, the statutory purpose means the preservation of the public health, maintenance of public order and the securing and regulating of the pricing, supply, and the distribution of food, water, fuel, light, and power, and other necessaries. So this act works within that boundary. So the, the intent, and I want to speak very clearly to the intent, I think mm -hmm. that's important, yeah. that you would make that initial contact with the individual, because civility. Correct. So you make contact Correct. with the individual, the owner, property, mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm and the conversation mm -hmm. would be had mm -hmm. does the individual need to agree no because it's been requisitioned for public purpose what you have to do in in every case this is as as you quite rightly said this is not the days of, of nazi germany we've identified it in fact this merchant may well be um so minded because they're getting rid of all their stock and they will be receiving prompt and full compensation. This is for public purpose. This is for our frontline workers, uh, uh, as is in the case. If it is, is, is food, um, there will be a need to feed the people. And you may have a warehouse stocked with, with um, certain staples that you want to get distributed out there. And this is an opportunity to, to thank those persons, uh, if you recall, during the state of emergency, those yeah. um, enterprises, those companies um, who donated generously or, or cut down on their markup, they have been paid. Most of them have been settled as far as I'm aware. But that notwithstanding, the state had that responsibility to public order, public health, etc. And so we not necessarily have to perhaps completely take over um, property, but oh, yeah, yeah. arrangements where they'd be leasing it for a period of Correct. time Correct. And, and things of that sort. Correct. So there is that latitude there Correct. for Correct. for things. What about businesses? Because in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. we heard about the president being able to use some old law where you can have businesses uh, cease their normal operation mm -hmm. and begin to manufacture mm -hmm. um, the products that they would need. Mm -hmm. Do we have discovered under perhaps the intent under that whole requisition of 
-hmm. as well when it comes to businesses mm -hmm. if we mm -hmm. need to enter that conversation mm -hmm. if any businesses mm -hmm. will need to change what they're okay. doing to fit right. the situation so here's what we did um the the, the u.s um scenario um, comes with the um a tradition of manufacturing they have the energy etc etc you will observe the that we gave concessions and we permitted um, certain companies who produce alcohol based um, products to prepare and um, we gave them the encouragement and we incentivize the changing of their operations to produce some uh, hand sanitizers etc etc so from our and it, it was well, that was part of the consultation. We gave them the capacity to, to get in there and, and change their plant, keep persons employed, change their product. Uh, I, I, and you, you see a qu quite a few local um, hand sanitizers and etc. being used. Right. Let's move on to the suggestion that the Minister and the Minister for Finance, which <coughs> we alluded to him earlier, having too much power in terms of the ability of uh, the, the rules governing mm -hmm. procurement. Right. And I think that is also another concern, a sticking point. What are the powers of the, 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 minister, the, the ministers with respect to what they can do with the uh, public purse? So we go back to the statutory, return to the statutory purpose as to what COVID demands of us. We also appreciate that similar to what has happened even from the standpoint of legislation that to to protect life and limb to provide for our people there will be a need uh, to waive the procurement rules and by waiver the procurement rules they mean um, by way there'll be the, the, the tenders etc 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 because we need these products in real time if we need some p and th th this may not reflect what is happening in St. Lucia right now, but Lord forbid, if it, we have a, a spike or the second wave as we're hearing across in Martinique and Guadeloupe and Antigua and, and, and well, in, in Europe and the US and Canada, if this were to happen, then we need to, to give the Minister of Finance on, and the Minister of, of uh, Health, Health the power to determine what products that we need because again these lists are not formulated by the prime minister and the minister of health sitting at the table as we do the technocrats will determine based on the need so the people on the ground with the exactly. knowledge exactly they are the ones who make that determination and here's the important part the minister responsible for finance shall every quarter lay a report before parliament on a that is subsection 12 uh sorry section 12 subsection 2 which deals with the power to waive procurement rules um it reads the minister responsible shall every quarter lay a report before parliament on a the total expenditure of the goods and services procured b the suppliers of the goods and services procured and see the reasons for the use of the suppliers of the goods and the providers of, of, the, of the services. In other words, why are you using Mr. A and not Mr. B? This is transparency. We, the, 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 the taxpayer is, is, on, is the one going to be paying for this. So if you're going to waive the procurement rules, we need to know, Mr. Prime Minister, and um, uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Minister of Finance, um, Madam Minister of Health, the total expenditure of the goods and services procured. Well, actually, the, the report is to be presented by the Minister of Finance to Parliament. And it will indicate total expenditure. How much did you pay for the goods and services which you procured? B, the suppliers from whom did you acquire, procure rather, the goods and services? And C, why did you choose this person, Mr. A, to supply the goods and, and the providers of the service? It is all above board and it has to be presented. Um, it has to be laid before Parliament 
by the Minister of Finance every, every quarter. quarter. Now, we haven't had that. So is this retroactively applied? So, the, uh, thank you for the question again. And as per the state of emergency, I can assure you that the Director of Finance is, 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 is that is mandated under the state of emergency under the uh, Emergency Powers Act. I think it's six weeks after the, um, the uh, expiration of the, the, the state of emergency after the revocation of the proclamation mm -hmm. of the state of emergency which occurred uh, on, the, on the 30th, 30th of September, six weeks. So the clock is, count, is ticking. And it's we will be having that information correct, presented correct. in Parliament. It will be presented in Parliament. That, Why does that, it have to take the complete end? Because we've had the state of emergency extended and we didn't have well, the, a report. Again, this is um, because of the nature of the state of emergency and the fluidity um, within which things operate. The drafters of, of the constitution, and, and I think it was I, I, wise of them to wait till that thing is revoked, till the, the state of emergency is revoked, to bring in all your receipts and present this report. What did you do? This is your account. This is your financial account. When it was being extended, this was the politicians justifying and also uh, informing the state for the reasons for doing X, Y, and Z. But now I want the, the, they are mandated by the uh, Emergency Powers Act to give an account of what was spent. So in effect, we're closing that chapter Correct. as we now have the Correct. act. So Correct. we'll simply settle mm -hmm. everything Correct. under the state of emergency Correct. then. And we have ensured that this feature appears in our act. And so they are so guided are so by the guided. act and to, and to act in accordance Correct. With, with the act. What happens if we don't receive it? Well, they would be in breach of the, of the, um, the, the act. And Is there that, a penalty attached to that? For um, there, there isn't a penalty, but good government governance determines that this be done. Okay. You give an oversight to that? Well, once I am in the chair, the rule of law will be followed. <laughs> I can give you that assurance. <laughs> Is there a ceiling amount of the procurement? I know you were concerned about direct awards being given. So since, uh, you know, the, the public wouldn't hear about it until mm. after the fact, Sorry. what guides the procurement uh, process then? I know the need and so Correct. forth, but in terms of ceiling amounts. So... How do we, the, it begs the question then, how do you determine a ceiling amount when we are dealing in theory that this, this um, disease, we will be dealing with COVID for about two years. It can be extended. So you want to give that flexibility to the decision makers, ultimately director of, sorry, minister of finance, minister of health, to make a determination based on need um, and you, you will see that they have commissioned, is it, sorry, um, in the requisitioning, they speak of building mm -hmm. vessel, which I imagine to be a ship or aircraft. These things come, come out at a significant cost. So um, it is drafted in such a way as to give that level of flexibility. Um, thankfully, this has not happened and we, we, there was no reason to resort to it under the state of emergency but this has been permitted to be, be put this in, in in this act for the purpose of giving them that level of flexibility because something may happen at the spur of the moment and we may have to get that product from the other side of the world the um, tender process we militate against that quick response. But again, I wish to reiterate that there is that level of accountability and reporting. And good governance in, determines good, governance. good sense. Correct. And it is the, to use the example, it isn't simply the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Health making a decision. They are going to be guided by the, the technocrats. They know what the need is on the ground. How much rice do we need? How much sugar? whatever the, the, the staples are. No, we spoke about having the vessel, the aircraft, right. um, and I'm thinking that 
we may not need to go that far, but the provision is being made mm -hmm. in the event, given the fluidity current, of the current, situation. Current. So it doesn't mean that just because it's there, the mm -hmm. minister can just wake up one morning mm -hmm. and say, well, I see, you know, the mm -hmm. MV Marabella, Correct. I want that. Correct. That's, yeah? That is not going to happen. Okay. And you, you may requisition a, 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 an aircraft, for instance, if you, you need to evacuate someone or, or some, some folks or as happens with uh, even our COVID-19 testing. I am not too certain, but at some point it was being done in Trinidad and we had to rely on um, um, the, the, the I, I believe it's the uh, uh, one of the regional security agencies yes, to assist us the RSS, RSS, RSS that is yes. it. thank you very much to assist with it so we may come uh, it, it may come the time may come where we may have testing to do we may have to to get requisition we, we go to the airport so we need to use your, your plane to get these product to get these tests out of the country and um you will be compensated or oh, even individuals we there had the case go. where people were stranded in countries and correct. we couldn't correct. uh get them out correct. fast enough correct once we could bear that cost that that is um, an option available but again the parameters of covid 19. this is not someone going on a joy ride you, you must tie whatever action that is taken because it to needs the suppression to be justified of that. that is correct so as we wind it down in our conversation, uh, let's look at some of the, uh, the, the events on the periphery. Mm -hmm. um, we had the Senate. <clears throat> There's some interesting developments there. We had the opposition senators failing to show mm -hmm. the two consecutive days. Mm -hmm. um, two independent senators reporting ill, unable to be there. We also had the case of the government having a new senator in right. the person of Ferropolios being right. sworn in. So the Senate was unable to sit mm -hmm. Thursday, that's mm -hmm. the 1st of October, right. as there was no quorum. Mm -hmm. And the following day, the Friday, the 2nd, we saw that the Governor General appointed two temporary senators mm -hmm. uh, in the persons of Marcella Johnson mm -hmm. and Jacinta uh, mm -hmm. Lee. Um, so they were able to come in to get the business of the government to proceed. Mm -hmm. Was there anything unconstitutional or the word banded about illegal? Okay. So about this process we had a the, the scenario occurred um this this took um i believe most i will not say everyone by surprise um so as i understood it to have happened on the on the first at uh, that uh, sit when they they convene tried to convene the senate the president would have realized that she fell short of the, the quorum because you have no one from the side opposite and you had the excuse from the independent senators um, your quorum consists of six senators mm -hmm. plus the presiding the president that's by um, order order eight of the standing orders of the of the senate so there was no there was no there was no sitting the the business of the day nothing was conducted so the the my understanding but before you go on ag mm. the thinking is mm. that once the uh president came to the chamber mm. sat mm. and addressed mm. the chamber mm. that the senate was in session no no that 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 is that is not my understanding of of the chain of events because first of all the business of the day would have to be established sorry the uh, quorum would have to be established before they go into the business of the day and it so is, what she did was simply announce that there was no quorum that and, is and all so she the announced that is correct proceed. correct now th there's a uh, there's a bit of a mix-up in the sense that you those who follow the parliamentary procedure etc would notice that on occasion the sergeant of arms would be asked by if it's the speaker or the president we do not have a quorum please summon the other members and he would duly leave the chamber and 
try to get summon the, the members to come up to the chamber. If after five minutes um, he's they were unable to get that quorum, then the next step would be to adjourn it to another day. This is where the seven days would come into play. But even then, it has she she has the discretion. That is the um, the president of the senate to shorten it. So it's, it's not even written in stone that it has to be um, seven day days wait. unless the president otherwise directs. That's um, order number eight, um, subsection three. So when the order to summon the senators has been given in the Senate, the president shall, after the expiration of five minutes, count the Senate. If a quorum is not then present, he shall adjourn the Senate without question put. The adjournment shall be for seven days unless the president otherwise directs. So it envisages a situation where or be into the business of the day you are you, she either in our case um uh Ms. Girodi identif um is able to determine that we do not have a quorum or it is brought to attention madam president we don't have a quorum to re-establish the quorum that is when this kicks in this is not what happened on that day so th this is a, a completely different scenario that that is right however we go into the next step of the appointment of the senators, or the, the independent senators, to, to constitute, to constitute that, quorum. that quorum. That's the following day. And when you look at the order of business, it starts with prayers, and then you move into the next section, which the, um, the, uh, speaks to appointment of new senators, because the, the, the uh, standing orders anticipates that there will be a, a scenario there will be an occasion where you may have to populate the senate with new senators the appointment is made by the governor general let's not lose sight of that the, the governor general makes the appointment and the oath is taken in the chamber that is what is taken there is no need to vote for the newest the the, the, the temporary um, appointees um, and the in the um in, the, in senate, the senate in the senate so you simply go in here prayers you go into the the um appo the appointment of of, of senate of, of of new senators then you go into the announcements etc 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 and the business of the day and the business of the day and the, the the other principles that operate and and cater for these scenarios um uh the doctrine of necessity etc but there was nothing irregular this is something that i had considered and i had I have been able to since um, establish that uh, there's there's nothing irregular about that the alternative would be let, let's let's deal with a scenario as um where for whatever reason you have the majority of your senators being incapacitated does it mean that absolutely no business is done surely that cannot be what is envisaged and we have taken a simple a literal um, um, uh, interpretation you read the order rule the um, standing orders for the the senate it is clear what the procedure is you have your prayers you you, you take the oath of the new senators and uh, for affirmation and then you, you move on to Oath of allegiance of new senators, and then you move on to the 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 business the of the business day, of the announcements, etc., etc. Et so the maneuver to appoint the the, the temporary senators, mm -hmm. because the constitution does speak to that, mm -hmm. uh, that the governor general mm -hmm. can, and then of course these individuals temporary. Mm -hmm. So once the um, substantive holders, the substantive senators, mm -hmm. are well enough, and they've mm -hmm. indicated that they're well enough, mm -hmm. these temporary senators will cease to exist as members of the Senate. In fact, the tenure was for that one sitting. Just for that one Correct. sitting. Okay. Now, and if needs were to be, then another process would have to Correct. ensue. Correct. Correct. But I wish them well. Um, I, I, I'm not certain what they're afflicted with, but... Um, from my information, I'm told that they, they were unwell. That being the case, mm -hmm. what would have been the harm in waiting until they were well? Hmm. I like the, the use of the word harm. 
because we would have been thoroughly exposed as a nation. And that, that was, for me, the nightmare scenario because it would have meant between... The, in, in fact, some, some was suggesting that we could have um, put Senate for next week Thursday, which is tomorrow. So between... Uh, was it last week Thursday, which was yeah. the first, mm -hmm. to now, we would have nothing in place because, and I, I encourage anyone to put, to get their hands on any of the, um, the, the um, SIs, the, the statutory instruments during the COVID period. It will state expiry, it's tied to the state of emergency. So when that state of emergency ended on the 30th, we had nothing. We had nothing. And between the 30th and now, we have one person. Yes, we have one new case. Correct. So let's, let's deal with the scenario. Would we be able to advance or, or impose any protocol on, on that individual? The answer is no. Like they, shifting the person from the quarantine, you must get into the respiratory there, hospital, there you, go. you must get this there you so go. and so and so done. And that's someone who came in um, via airplane, that, that is my information. I actually yes. haven't read the press release, yeah. but my information is that this person is a local. Who yes, a returning home, national. A returning national. And... Um, so the it, contact that, tracing... The contact tracing... None would of have that been have affected been if we had nothing. Correct. That person would have been out... Um, in the general public, back in their community, and uh, it, it would literally be what I, what I just said earlier, the, the nightmare scenario. But, Lisa, my interpretation of the law during this period is independent of that. If we couldn't do it, then that would have been my advice. But I was satisfied from the moment the scenario occurred in, in the Senate as to the way forward. Um, and it is independent of the need. It was a, night, a nightmare scenario. It continues to be my nightmare scenario because once we get put, take our foot off that, that gas pedal, once we, if we were to stop implementing those protocols, we would all be vulnerable. You made a comment earlier uh, about the instructions given, you know, where the bill that the act is concerned. But hearing you now, what you've just said, I'm getting the impression that you are more heavily involved than the public would know mm -hmm. um, when it comes to COVID-19 mm -hmm. and the legislation and guiding mm -hmm. how we go along. So this isn't a case where you were being dictated to Mm. by the executive as to what the executive mm. wanted to see done and you must do that to the letter or uh, else Lisa I smile <laughs> because I'm certain my my cabinet colleagues are also smiling because this is not how I operate and in fact my my tagline is um, that I engineer my I do not engineer my legal advice to any scenario the law speaks for itself and I hope whether when, when I uh, prepare an opinion and I advise cabinet that it can be defended even when I'm not there, I'm not present to defend it. So I'm guided by the law, by the rule of the law, and I refuse to deviate from that. I believe I'll be doing the country a disservice, um, my profession a disservice, and a disservice to myself as a professional. This is, this is not how I operate. Um, I endeavor at every juncture to give the best legal advice that I can. It is not done in a vacuum. There are persons, we, we have a very capable team at, uh, at the Attorney General's Chambers. Um, there are other persons who we consult when the need arises. But at the end of the day, when it's, it's about quality in terms of the, 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 the type of advice that is given. Um, and there are scenarios, for instance, with, with the, uh, the, what occurred in the Senate, where you may not have the opportunity to, to, to um, consult if, with persons far and wide. But at the time, we were able to marshal our resources 
and make the best decision and and give the best advice that we, we possibly could in the scenario as we have our one minute wrap up there let me just ask you so mm -hmm. The act is there. It's already enacted. The bill enacted. Mm -hmm. Now that it has passed, mm -hmm. um, can it still be amended? It certainly can. And you know, in all the, the, the drama of the day, persons have forgotten that there is another piece of legislation that we were dealing with with regard to the Companies Act. Mm. Most persons have forgotten that. But there was this act which dealt with the times of operation for the, the, the registry of companies. It was dealt with there. Um, we, we've dealt with legislation under the, the CIP Act dealing with the, the economic fund where, where we had to, to put a proper framework for the administration. To access that money Th there you for go. COVID. There you go. So, yeah. so um, again, COVID may well require us to revisit certain aspects of this Act. But as it pertains to to the rights of St. Lucians, the protection of the rights of St. Lucians. We have ensured that is done, but also, and, and of, of great importance, is the protection of the health of, of the sainte of St. Lucians. That is very, very important. And we've, we've tried by this piece of legislation to capture what is, is needed and what we have been advised to do by the technocrats, by the, the other stakeholders, um, uh, who, all of everyone who has some input and some stake in, in making sure that we stay safe and that notwithstanding we, stay, we, are, we remain safe, etc., that we are able to, to maintain some level of economic activity. We need to while we are under trying to protect trying the, to health protect the health of our people. So we can have individuals can contact the chambers mm -hmm. for the concerns that they may have, queries, mm -hmm. suggestions, right. because since you say amendment is still possible. Correct. So here's the process. Um, and I have always been hesitant to do so because uh, it's, it's not just the bureaucracy, but you must have some levels of reporting and the development of policy, etc. This is one of the reasons we have come up with the command center so you have the various ministries in there they are able to go out they have a they have greater capacity to go in to the communities to go into the various sectors and get the information which will trigger the various amendments so um let's say tourism you have um, the, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of, of Tourism who's there. Mm -hmm. So the stakeholders in that sector would go to her. They understand the language, they understand the need of that sector. And uh, once it's properly consumated, the, no, the instructions would come to us. And then and the, the come determination would be made. There you go. On that. Yes. So AG, final question. For St. Lucia, this seems to be that we are leading the charge. Do you see that St. Lucia will be looked at by the rest of the Caribbean, even as a wider world, as being a leader where this legislation is concerned? Well, um, my, my focus really is on our need because each country has their, their own legislative agenda, their, their legislation and peculiar circumstances. And peculiar circumstances. Uh, but we stand ready, as I articulated earlier, to uh, assist um, wherever needed in terms of advice because we, we, we find it similar to our uh, rules of procedure uh, for the, the, the civil courts and, and what have you, especially in the OECS. We, we're trying to um, sort of codify some of the, the laws have a similar legislation throughout that space etc um so there, there's that synergy um with, with the other countries and we we, op we open we, we more than open to to assist if if the need arises we're also open to learn uh, um, from them so the focus really is getting a product getting that piece of legislation that satisfies the the, sin, the need for St. Lucia, the peculiar circumstances that COVID has brought to St. Lucia. Um, and uh, 
I'll be quite satisfied if, 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 if we are able to accomplish that. And I urge persons, I, I, I urge persons to familiarize themselves with that piece of legislation um, and to not lose sight. When I drive around on my commute to and from work, it it's, appears to me that it's business as usual. It's yes, um, out of the consciousness correct. of the so individuals. We, we, yes. I would implore persons to, to take a second look at, at this thing, see what's happening, not to far. Martinique is, is, I think, 25 miles away, less than an hour by prerog. Um, we are still very vulnerable, and whatever gains that we have made can evaporate in, in, in a week, if, if even less. So I, I, I urge ult ultra vigilance and um, I hope for the best, that's the best case scenario. Well, AG, let me say thank you so much. Your conversation has been a very comprehensive one. And I just want to reiterate that um, all St. Lucians should familiarize themselves. We know we will be having the um, act uh, uploaded to the government website. And so that should give you easy access for you to be able to get on there online and read. We've been speaking with the Attorney General. He's Honorable Stephen Julian. And we've been discussing the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Bill, which is now an act. act yes. And uh, we do hope that you have found the discussion very enlightening. All left for me to say is to thank you very much to the staff here at the official uh, residence of the Prime Minister for accommodating this, this interview. Our studios are otherwise unable to be accessed. I am Melissa Joseph. Thank you so much for watching.